Sarah, we're live. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Hi. Hello. Um, I am Mohanan. And I am the other Mohanan. I'm Tara. Um, welcome to this first um, live session of the online course, the free online course, Introduction to Research. It is offered under the banner of THINK, spelled T-H-I-N-Q, uh, but pronounced THINK, um, not THINK you. Um, now in THINK, the TH stands for THINK, I-N for inquire, and Q for question. Um, th in THINK, we are a group of individuals who wish to keep developing our abilities to think, inquire, and question uh, across academic domains, and also help others do the same. Now, when this course was announced, um, it, was, it was supposed to be offered by Mornin. Um, but like most of our work, um, this is also joint work, so he will do most of the talking because he likes to, and I will be around to butt in if and when it seems necessary. Now, before we go into the course, um, we would be, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Um, the course has a fairly large organizational component um, because it, it has uh, more than 1,500 participants. And a very large part of the organiza organizing behind the scenes um, is being done by Aditi. Um, Aditi has also been giving us feedback on all the course material, um, which is the chapters that you will be getting each week. So Aditi, do you want to say hi and take a bow? Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right. And um, we also have with us Madhav, who has been working behind the scenes. He um, is joining us from uh, the University of Arizona in the US. Um, you will be over the over the coming weeks, you will meet other members of the Think. Uh, Aditi and Madhav are both members of the Think team. And over the coming weeks, you will be meeting all the other members as well, a few at a time. Um, okay, well, Aditi, you want to tell us something about the organization of the course and the logistical yeah. details? Yep. Thank you, Tara. Um, at the outset, I'd like to thank everyone for showing us such an overwhelming interest in the course. Like Tara mentioned, we've had over 1500 registrations in just, in just a couple of weeks and the number keeps increasing. Uh, so Madhav and I will tell you how to how you can participate in this course beyond the YouTube sessions and keep up with it as we go along uh, in the course. Uh, the first thing is to come prepared for each session. Uh, we will share a chapter one week in advance and uh, you can go through it, uh, read the chapter before the session, make a list of the things that you don't understand, ask yourself questions, read it over and over again. If you have the time, I mean, yeah, if, if you have the time, read it as many times as possible uh, in order to consolidate your understanding of it. Um, and the other thing you can do is interact with participants um, on the various forums. So uh, I'll, Madhav, while yeah, I share my screen. Share screen. OK, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, it's very early in the morning where I am, so I apologize for my sleepy looking face. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, so as Aditi said, there's various fora in which you can um, uh, communicate with each other and with us. Uh, there is uh, Aditi showing her screen. Um, one of the things is, um, Aditi, if you go to the discussion forum, there's a good discussion forum, which I think most of you should already be a part of. If you're not, you'll be added in if you've registered for the course. Um, and um, and if you if you have any issues with uh, getting to that, email us. Uh, the other uh, the, so the discussion forum is a place where you can uh, email, uh, interact with more Tara uh, and the rest of us. Uh, there is the Discord, which the teachers went to. So let's go back there. That's for you guys to interact with each other. Once in a while, we may um, 
show up uh, in uh, and have conversations, but think of that as your your space for you to interact with each other, to uh, uh, form affinity groups, to talk to each other, and so on. Um, and finally, there's the the Reddit, uh, the subreddit, which we've created for uh, the course. And uh, please use this for for discussions. Um, and um, yeah, so this is also just another way for you to interact with the course materials, with us, and with each other. Okay. Um, anything else at the Madhav, Madhav, you mentioned affinity groups. Uh, yeah. Tara, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about affinity groups? Yeah, affinity groups are uh, groups of participants who work together to learn from one another and to sort out one another's problems. Um, and that then becomes quite a support. Every time we've used it, the feedback we've had is that it becomes a real, uh, really strong support group, not even through the course, but through life sometimes. So um, it's a good idea to, you know, it's, it's a forum where you can share ideas without being worried about um, how, we, how you will be judged or, you know, um, so it, it becomes a group of friends. Uh, um, we are recommending something like 10 to 15, right, per group. Anything between yeah. five and don't go beyond 15 because yeah, it, even 15 is kind of big. But um, yeah, try and uh, perhaps everyone should try and yeah. be part of an affinity group. And if you have people, lots of people in your institution, then join those people so that you can also meet face to face if possible. Yeah, so so I guess the 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 uh, onus on forming affinity groups for this course is on you guys because um, if it was a face to face course, it would be very different. And so um, uh, this is where you can use the Discord and so on to create small groups um, of uh, five to fifteen people. And, and we recommend yeah. that you meet at least once a week, yeah. either online or face to face. Uh, more if you want, but at least once yeah. a week. And when you ask us questions. We would appreciate it if you ask in, uh, questions in a group. The representative from each affinity group asks all your questions. Instead of if everybody asks us questions like 1,500, we'll just drown. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, if, right. if, if you are sending us questions from the affinity group, make sure to copy all your group members yeah. on it so that everyone knows the group is together. Yeah. They're, you're all on the same page. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say that to add to what Mohan Tara have just said, uh, the course doesn't have any monetary fee, as you all know, it's free. So the way you can contribute to improving the course is by giving us your feedback. Uh, we will link a feedback form, this feedback form in the chat for you. Uh, please take a few minutes after the session to fill it out. Uh, we also have the option of uh, you. I mean, you also have the option of signing up for a continuous feedback program. Uh, which means that we will be interacting with you throughout the course to take your feedback uh, in detail uh, through discussions and so on. Uh, so if you're interested in contributing to the course in that way, uh, do feel free to sign up and do take a minute to fill out that feedback form. Uh, before, I mean, I don't want to take... Yeah, just just one, one quick thing. So we'll be sharing that in the chat and it'll be in the description for people who are watching this later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, just a couple of other points worth remembering. I think we do not use titles to refer to each other, and we want to bring the same culture to this course as well. So please do not refer to any of us as sir or ma'am. If you're addressing questions to, as you must have noticed, we call uh, Mo and Tara, Mo and Tara. <laughs> and so please address your questions to them. And uh, as the session progresses, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. We're monitoring it. We may not be able to answer all of them, but we will try to address as many of them as possible. And uh, yes, do remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel and also to click on the bell icon so that you can be notified each time we begin a live and you don't miss a session because of that. All right, Madhav, anything else? No, nothing I can think of right now. Um, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll be back to yeah. work, to ask ask questions later on. Now we leave you guys with Mo and Tara. All right. All right. Okay. So. All right. Uh, before we get to the actual uh, introduction to research, we would like to say something about um, uh, what prompted us to start this course. 
and the, the 40, 40 years of the journey that led us to this course. Uh, I took my PhD from MIT in theoretical linguistics, MIT meaning Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1982. This was in theoretical linguistics. And Tara took hers in, uh, from Stanford University in 1990. And uh, you might then ask, why are we? Yeah, actually, why? right. Yeah. So the mention of the bells and whistles is um, by way of background for uh, to address two things. Um, one is um, for those who might have who might wonder what linguistics is all about. Um, linguistics is a science that tries to understand how human language works, and the kind of linguistics that we do. Um, comes under cognitive science. Now, to give you a better sense of the discipline, uh, rather than talk and take time right now, what we'll do is we'll send you a note about it tomorrow. Okay. Now, the second point is it's actually a question that many of you may have in your mind and many have asked explicitly, which is given that our specialization is in linguistics, what justification, what legitimacy do we have to talk about, to give, to teach a course where the material, the, the, uh, the subject matter spans, you know, a range of subjects all the way from mathematics to the physical, biological, human sciences and um, the humanities. And this is, you want to address that? Um. Yeah, th this this is going to be a question that many of you might be asking. How how come theoretical linguists are talking about research in mathematics and physics and biology and so on? And the reason is very simple. We even in linguistics we were uh, we have done research in different domains of linguistics, things like phonology, which is the study of sound systems, syntax, which is a study of sentences, structure of sentences, morphology, which is a study of structure of words semantics with the study of meanings and so on, uh, usually linguistic to one of these disciplines. And we have done research in many of those. And we've also dabbled a little bit in applied linguistics. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we are kind of generalists, even though our spe specialization is in one part of linguistics, we are generalists. And then at some point, we started getting interested in other subjects as well. We started asking questions like, how do mathematicians do their research? And we started bugging mathematicians about it. How do physicists do it? How do historians? And whenever we have uh, an opportunity, we bug specialists about their modes of research. And we discovered that even though there are differences across disciplines, there are certain common elements in uh, research across disciplinary boundaries. And we thought it was a good idea to identify those things which are common, what we call transdisciplinary elements of research what all forms of research have in common so that students can learn those as the foundations and then they can take care of the details. So if you learn about learn the, the abilities and the understanding of transdisciplinary research there, and if you are a biologist, you can build the biology specific research on top of that. If you're a mathematician, you can build your mathematics special research abilities on top of the, the foundations of transdisciplinary research. And this is what we have been doing for the last at least 30 years, perhaps even more. 40 more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's been a, a lot of fun. It's been a lot of learning and uh, exciting too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, so at this point, we'll take, a, uh, take any questions you might have before we plunge yeah. into chapter one. You can type your questions and we'll respond to them. Tara, there are no questions as of yet. Uh, okay. So I think you can. Go so we'll just go should, ahead. Should we wait for a few seconds for people to type questions? If there are questions. We can take those later. Uh, perhaps you should continue and we can have take those questions in the 20 minute section in the end. Okay. okay. All right. So let's, let's uh, proceed directly. Uh, we assume that uh, all of you have read chapter one and we have you have struggled with it and you you may have uh, areas or little pieces that you may not fully understand. So what we are going to do is to point to the main 
elements of uh, the different sections in that chapter and then invite questions from you uh, after every every section yeah and um, if uh, you have clarificatory questions you can ask them at the end of every chunk yeah and if not if it's a general question then you could wait till the yeah. end okay. Yeah. okay okay so <laughs> we uh, began chapter 1 with the question what is research and we answer the question by saying research is a process a process that aims at uh, contributing uh, aims to contribute to the existing body of academic knowledge now that uh, it's important to realize that we are saying we are aiming not really actually contributing so it could be the case that we aim at making a contribution but we don't really succeed but that doesn't matter it would still count as research okay uh, then we, we we said that the process of research uh, consists of four parts. One is research questions. And the next is ways of looking for answers to the research questions. And the third is uh, the, the answers themselves. And once we have the answers, quite often it is important to think about the answers, interpret the answers, and arrive at, arrive at certain conclusions based on those answers. That's the next step. And then we justify it the conclusions that we have arrived at to the satisfaction of the research community. These are the kind of main elements of uh, research. And these are the elements that we'll be talking about in the next few weeks in, in various chapters, different aspects of these four things. Um, yeah, and, this is the, and this is there in the, uh, in the figure yeah. um, on page two of chapter one. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things that I'd like to point out here. One is we've talked about the process of research, but how does that process begin? There has to be some kind of a trigger for research. And um, the trigger can be just about anything. It can be an experience, uh, an observation, a random conversation, um, and you know, a chance encounter, or something that you're reading, and it or it could just be an idea popping into your head. But the process of research begins only when you have formulated that trigger as a question that you want to answer or as a problem that you want to solve. Now, like everything else, um, research also has two aspects. There is the art of it and the craft of it. Um, the art calls for things like imagination, intuition, insight, and so on. Uh, it's not structured, it can't be planned. The craft, on the other hand, has to do with the techniques that we learn and the skills that we develop through practice. Now, given that art is not something that can be taught, we are go our focus is going to be on the craft part of it. Um, Okay, there was one other thing that I wanted to, okay, that had come to mind. All right, um, it's, yeah, so the trigger, the trigger for research falls in the, on the art side, so we won't be talking about that. The course will fo focus on the craft aspect of research. The second thing I wanted to say was that um, when you do come, when you do think up and formulate a question, how do you know that it's a good question? It's going to, it's worthy of research. Well, for this, what is needed is a sense of feasibility of um, the process of how would you go about looking for an answer? Uh, a sense of the plausibility of the findings, uh, how, how, um, sound are there, are you going to find something really um, new? Uh, that, that's another question. And the third is a sense of the significance of your finding of the output. Now, all of these are things that you develop through experience. So if you are a novice and you sort of don't have a sense of that, this is where you need a guide or an advisor. Right. So, again, those are the kinds of things that we will not be talking about. Um, those were the yeah. two things I wanted to point out. Yeah. 
it's quite possible that the words that we are using, research question, methodology, and so on, it, these words may not be quite clear to many of the people who are attending this course. Uh, but please bear with us because those, the meanings of these words will become clear as we proceed. So we are trying to, to, to kind of draw a broad picture in, a, in an outline which could be vague, but the vagueness would disappear as we go on with the specific examples. There'll be lots and lots of examples in this course. And it's when we deal with those examples that gradually the, the cloudy areas will become crystallized into clear understanding. Uh, so should we, uh, is this, is this another a, point for yeah for questions okay. if you have any. I think it's very important for you to ask questions. So we are offering you that chance by saying we are going to pause and let you ask questions. Uh, because if you don't have, if you don't ask questions, uh, you may not understand what we are saying with sufficient clarity. Yeah. So go ahead and ask uh, questions. There are a few questions, but uh, I think we should perhaps, none of them are clarificatory per se. So I feel like we should proceed and uh, yeah. we take Let's these questions. Let's answer at least one question so that people would be encouraged to ask questions. Otherwise, there won't be any questions. Can you select one question, for, for example? Uh, so, OK, incidentally, someone has asked why they can't call you uh, sir or ma'am. Uh, um, so we'll answer that question briefly and then yeah. uh, take up questions. The reason is the reason is that there is so much of uh, asymmetry between teachers and students in the classroom. Teachers are up above and students are way low below. It's almost like a caste system. In research, there is no caste system. There is democracy. We are all equal. So it is important that students learn to disagree with us, to challenge us, and to and to show that we are wrong. And this is a symbolic gesture. If you call us sir, and we don't call you sir, then we are pretending to be superior to you. We don't want to do that. So this is a kind of symbolic gesture to say, in the research world, there is perfect democracy. And you have to get used to that democracy. Yeah. And a, a couple of days ago, somebody asked the same question and said that uh, the sir or ma'am is meant to show respect. But respect is mutual and learning is also mutual. Yeah. We may have more experience than you, but we also learn from you. Yeah. So respect is mutual, one. And two, um, addressing somebody as sir or ma'am is not, you can address them as sir or ma'am and have yeah. no respect for them. And you can address them as uh, by their names, by their first names, and still have very deep respect yeah. for them. So that doesn't count. Yeah. Okay. So I have respect for Tara. I don't call her ma'am or Professor Mohanan or your highness and so on. You don't need those words to show respect. OK, I think we yeah. should go on. Okay. OK, so for the next yeah. part, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Aditi. Sorry, please continue. So there were the three examples of yeah. research. You want to talk about those? Yeah, one of them, uh, one example was the tongue twisters. Uh, so we ask you to say green, blue, green, green, blue, blue, green, green, blue, and ask you to say it faster and faster. Blue, green, green, blue, 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 blue. blue. I, I can't say that too fast. And the other was blue, blue, green, green, blue, blue, green, green, and ask you to say it faster and discovered that was easy. So much the question easier. was, yeah, much easier. Most people, we have done this experiment with many people. The question is, <clears throat> the string is exactly the same. There is no difference. So how come the first one is difficult, the second one is easy? So we uh, try to engage with that question. And this was one example. That's a, that's a research question that leads to some understanding of the nature of language, the linguistic organization, and its relation to speech production. The other was discrete geometry. And the basic idea here is to change some aspect of mathematics. So in Euclidean geometry, uh, a straight line can uh, even the smallest possible straight line can have infinitely many points. And we change that assumption, that axiom, to saying every finite straight line, a line segment, has finitely many points. So there could be a, a line with two points, or three points, or six points, and the length of a line is a number of points. That leads to a very different kind of geometry. 
And so you can ask the question, what are the theorems that are true in this kind of geometry? So that was another example of research. And another kind of research far away from mathematics and science is the question, do the, the scholastic aptitude test, SAT, do they actually test scholastic aptitude? We kind of tend to assume that you, know, uh, uh, you do that, but we want to raise the question, is that actually true? And that required a definition of a clearer understanding of scholastic aptitude and what the questions do and so on. So three, three research questions. These are examples. Uh, and hopefully that, that should give you some sense of what it is like to ask a research question as opposed to, say, an examination question, which is very different in nature. So uh, this may be, again, a good time to please ask questions. Uh, we are open to. So ask questions specifically about these three examples. Are there things that you didn't fully understand? We are assuming, of course, that uh, you've all read the yeah, chapter. Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, I just want to mention now that the chapters that Mo and Tara are referring to are linked in the description. Um, we need a couple of more minutes to sort through the questions. So perhaps uh, you could continue and I'll uh, get back to you in a couple of minutes. Sure. Okay. okay. Right. Is there um, anything you want to add to the previous while I think you're doing that before you go on to? Well, I, I kind of mentioned the difference between uh, examination questions and research questions. Examination, we ask an examination question to find out if the students know what we expect them to know. So the implicit assumption is students have already come up with the answers and they're just giving me the answers and or the giving teacher, the teachers. And yeah. the teachers have some answer in yeah, mind before. Specific. And in some cases, it could be the student should be able to figure out the answer in two minutes or three minutes fairly quickly through a mechanical process, such as, for example, making a calculation. A research question is very different. We ask a research question because there is something that we do not know. That's important. There is something we do not know, and we want to find out what that is. And we formulate the research question to clarify what it is that we do not know against the backdrop of what we know. This is not an examination question. And sometimes the research question will take, let's say, a month, uh, in some cases a year, maybe five years. But that is not feasible in an exam question because you have to answer the question in you know, very short time. Quite often, if it's a multiple choice question, you have to answer it in two minutes. That means you don't get any time to think, and research is impossible without thinking. Right. So that's the main difference between the two. All so right. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question. Um, may I know how we could specifically connect and integrate pieces of information to make them knowledge? Ah, that is <laughs> that. That will take some time. Uh, we we will discuss that, but it's but not possible it's, to do that in in. Actually, no. The answer to yeah. that is going to be cumulative. And in each session, you will get a better sense. Yeah. And we hope that by the end of the 12 weeks, you will have some idea yeah. of how to do it. But let me let me briefly find out if I can mm. answer that question on the basis of what people know in their school uh, physics, physical sciences. So you know that Galileo investigated the uh, motion of the simple pendulum, the oscillation of the simple pendulum. He also formulated laws about falling bodies, but he didn't quite connect the two. And Kepler explained the motion of the planetary motion. And these two were two different subjects. Newton came and constructed the theory of gravity in motion. And that integrated, unified Galileo's work and Kepler's work as a single, single theory. The same way you must you must know that there is a study of uh, light called optics. Uh, there is a study of electricity and there's a study of magnetism. And uh, sometime in the 20th century, these three were integrated as a single subject, single theory called electromagnetism and light was just part of that. Quantum mechanics is a continuation of that. 
And this is what you find throughout uh, the history of knowledge. Little pieces of knowledge, little theories get amalgamated into larger and larger theories. This is, this is probably a kind of uh, broad idea, but in order to understand exactly what it means, we have to go through the process of unification, integration yourself. Otherwise, you have to have your own first-hand experience of doing that. And, and we, see, hope, see, we yeah. hope you will see examples of it. And also, it takes the kind of mindset that we talked about right at the beginning of looking at things from a transdisciplinary perspective so that you can make connections. Okay, uh, it's it, With a lot of practice, it will come naturally, but it does take yeah. seeing a lot of examples, role models, and a lot of practice. Yes. Right, well, thank you. We have another question that's uh, come up a couple of times. Uh, how to distinguish between search and research about something? Okay. <laughs> the first thing to say is that so, so, uh, researching is not researching or oh, searching, searching again. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Searching, suppose, suppose I have lost my keys and I'm, you can say I'm searching for my keys. The keys exist in a particular place. So, for example, maybe the, the keys are in my pocket. I didn't know about it. I look around and find the key in my pocket. So there's a definite place where you can find it. We know that it exists somewhere. In research, there is no particular place where the answer exists. There could be many answers. And it could be, it could turn out to be the case that there are no answers. In fact, we might end up saying, there is no such thing as the key that you're looking for. That would be very strange conclusion if you are searching. Uh, so what you're doing is actually you're looking for an answer to arrive at a conclusion to make a contribution to knowledge. And that's not what you do when you search, right? When I look for my key, I'm not making a, trying to make a contribution to knowledge. So these are, even though it is called RE followed by S-E-A-R-C-H, they are the, the very different entities, different concepts. There is also another notion of research is information gathering. So you go to the library, gather some information, and then you come back and say, oh, I did some library research. That is not what we mean by research uh, in this context, in making a contribution to knowledge. And also, a research question is something that might have been asked before, but it doesn't have to be. You could be asking a completely new question that has never been asked before. So uh, that's the difference. Okay. Uh, we have a, a, a more specific question about uh, the discrete geometry thing which I thought, since you asked for specific questions, we can uh, get to that. Uh, Abhi asks, uh, I feel like the research question framed for discrete geometry is too general. When we ask what are the axioms and properties of X, Y, Z, uh, are there any general uh, guidelines to direct our inquiry? Yeah, we will We will deal with this question. Perhaps a better question will be, take a, take a, take a question like, if you make the assumption about discrete geometry that uh, every finite line has a finite number of points. Is it possible to bisect every line segment in this discrete geometry? And the answer could be very different from the kind of geometry that you're familiar with, Newtonian geometry. Yep. And you may also... Euclidean geometry. Euclidean oh, geometry, you okay. mean. <laughs> when I say Newtonian, I mean, of course, Euclidean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you can even answer the question, um, uh, what axioms and definitions do I need in order to get a particular uh, answer? Uh, and yeah. that's a slightly different way of framing the exact same thing. Uh, and so there's a few ways of thinking about this. Uh, of course, any question like any research question like this will be broad and general, and you yeah. have to figure out what you want to do with it. And we'll get to that as we go along. Um, yep. Come on. Uh, okay. So uh, the next part in the chapter was the the nature of academic knowledge and the structure of academic knowledge. Uh, we began by saying that knowledge is a body of statements that we judge to be true. Okay, let me repeat that. Knowledge is a body of statements that we judge to be true. We are not saying that knowledge is a body of statements are which true. are true, because we may not know whether it is true or not. The important part is we judge it to be true. And this is important because what we judge to be true may actually turn out to be false. But if it is true, you know, it cannot turn out to be false. That would be a logical contradiction. 
because you could say, I uh, believe that such and such statements were true, but it turned out, you know, now I know that those beliefs are false. So the fallibility is built into the way we conceptualize knowledge. And the other part of uh, the definition is knowledge is a body of statements that we just be true. What that means is it is not just one piece of st one statement in isolation, but connected body of statements. That's when information becomes knowledge. So if I go to an information counter in a ra railway station and ask, uh, when does the train come? And they tell you, oh, it comes at 7.45. That's a piece of information. It's not connected to anything else. That is not necessarily knowledge, even though we do use the word knowledge for such things as well, but not for academic knowledge. No, not really knowledge. Yeah. But we say that, I oh, I know when the train is going to come. Yeah. Uh, but that's not knowledge in the sense we are talking about. Yeah. That's we are defining knowledge slightly differently to distinguish between knowledge and information. Information is data. Uh, then there is this question of, okay, that is knowledge, but what is academic knowledge? Academic knowledge is a special kind of knowledge that have certain special attributes that uh, distinguish ordinary everyday knowledge from you know what are the what are the question is what are the norms of academic knowledge actually can i just butt in there mm -hmm. yes academic knowledge is one kind of knowledge it is special in the sense that all bodies of knowledge are special so folk knowledge have has its own yeah. speciality yeah. But academic knowledge is just it's not that it's special or higher than or superior to anything else. It's just that it has certain constraints, certain conditions or criteria that it has to satisfy. Yeah. Okay. So one, uh, one of the uh, criteria would be that academic knowledge is collective knowledge. So we are distinguishing between collective knowledge of the human species on the one hand and personal knowledge. So take, for example, my knowledge that I had idli for breakfast this morning. OK, uh, is this part of the knowledge of the human species? Is anybody else interested in what I had for breakfast? No, this is simply part of my personal knowledge. Uh, academic knowledge, on the other hand, is concerned with the collective knowledge of the human species. That's one. Collective knowledge that is open to, available to yeah. the human species. Yeah. We're not saying that. Every human yeah. being has to have that knowledge. It's just that it's available to everyone. Yeah. It should be of interest to everybody, all human beings. Uh, and the other condition is that uh, academic knowledge is rational knowledge. Now, what does that mean? Rational means that we, if we accept a set of premises, we should also accept their conclusions. So if we accept the premise, for example, that all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then an obvious conclusion is that Socrates is mortal. If you accept all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, you cannot reject uh, Socrates is mortal. That's one of the conditions. This is the condition of logical consequence. We must accept the logical consequences of the premises that we accept. The second condition is to do with uh, logical contradiction. In a body of knowledge, uh, it cannot be the case that two statements are logically contradictory. So it couldn't be the case that we believe that the Earth is flat, and at the same time, we believe that the Earth is round. They're logically contradictory. Okay. So avoid logical contradictions, and or that is to say, reject logical contradictions and accept logical consequences. These are two important parts of uh, the norms of academic knowledge. There is another condition related to this, namely, if there are conclusions that we put forward, as opposed to just premises, conclusions must be rationally justified. And when we say rationally justified, we mean proved, argued for, provide evidence for, and so on and so on. We'll come to this. Yeah, this course is yeah. largely about that. So you will see more of that, of these details yeah. as we go along. And the fourth condition is that uh, we mentioned this earlier, that it should not be pieces of information. They should be interconnected. They should be integrated and, if possible, unified. Uh, what These are words which may not be very clear right now. But as we, uh, as we proceed, 
the, the meanings of these words will become clear. And an automatic consequence of all these is that we view all forms of academic knowledge as uncertain and fallible. So the kind of belief that most students come to school with is that knowledge is absolute. The, the knowledge that is given in textbooks cannot be wrong. The truth. And this is what examination questions ask you. Right? You have to have the correct answer. You have to have the truth at your disposal. But in uh, academic research, there is no such thing. Even, uh, even mathematics, which is prob much more certain than science, uh, there is no absolute, there is no guarantee that a mathematical theorem is not false. There is always a possibility that everything that we know is anything that we take could turn out to be false. Not that everything we know is false, but there could be, you know, uh, fallible statements anywhere. And, and it's an important uh, point. To, I mean, it's an important mindset to have in research that what we know could be wrong. To have the, that yeah. sense of fallibility and the sense of humility that goes with mm. it. There's, Anything, a, yeah. there's a certain kind of intellectual humility that allows you to say, this is what I believe, but I could be wrong. And that's the characteristic of an academic. Somebody who is completely certain that their beliefs are true uh, will not be able to learn any further. OK. Uh, you want to talk about the structure of academic know how, how it's should we, at least in the institutional context or actually should yeah. we wait for questions or should no, I we... think briefly and then I think that's all we have for okay. today so all right we... then we might as yeah. well go through that right uh, that Very part quick. is actually fairly easy because I think we have laid it out in the textbook uh, the chapter uh, usually in school we think think about dividing knowledge into things like mathematics on the one hand subjects and subjects right. yeah and then there is science, and there is social science. The implication here is that social science is not science. And we raised several objections to that position and said two different kinds of objections. One, many of the things that come under the so-called social science have nothing to do with the study of society. So psychology, for example, is the study of mind. Why is psychology called a social science? The kind of linguistics that Tara and I do is, uh, as we said, study of a uh, part of cognition, which is part of the study of the human mind. But that's also called social science. We don't study society at all. Conversely, on the other side, there are biologists who study social patterns of chimpanzees, of bacteria, of bees, wasps, and so on. That's not called social science. Why not? If, if social science is the study of society, what these biologists are studying, study of society of chimpanzees and bacteria and plants and so on, should be called sociology. But nobody does that. So this, the, the term social science as distinct from science is actually irrational, incoherent, arbitrary. And psychology is supposed to be social science. But what about psychiatry, which is based on psychology? Psychiatry is supposed to be a science. Actually, we write a yeah. note on that. Um, yeah, I think. No, oh, it is there. I think it is outlined yeah. in yes, there. Yes, yeah. but but where it came from? Where That's is, right. Yeah, they, yeah. They, there is there is a historical reason for that terminology, but that doesn't mean that terminology is coherent. That it is, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is rational. Okay, uh, I think I think we should stop now for questions. Yeah. Okay, we have we don't have very much time now. Okay, questions. All right. Mother, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm struggling to actually find the question in. Ah, so there was a very quick question on um, mathematics um, and on the nature of mathematics. Uh, so there's there's two set theories, one with and one without the axiom of choice. So is the axiom of choice accepted or not? Um, so. The question is asking whether um, the axioms of mathematics you accept or not. OK, now, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but let me put it this way. In different theories, you could have axioms which, which if you take two axioms from two different theories in mathematics, the axioms could be logically contradictory. 
So I, I don't know if you mentioned this in the first chapter, but at some point we are going to raise this question. Let's take an axiom about straight lines. The standard axiom is every no straight line when extended, even when extended, you know, infinitely, can meet itself. This is the kind of Euclidean axiom of straight lines. We could have a different kind of axiom saying uh, every straight line when extended will meet itself. Now, these two axioms are logically contradictory. The second one would be in spherical geometry, yes. a different system. It, so these are two different systems. Of yeah. Geometry. And also they're describing two different worlds. So the demand is that we cannot have logically contradictory axioms within a theory or about a given particular work. The axiom that I mentioned about discrete geometry is the same. Like uh, you could assume that there are infinitely many points in every line segment. And discrete geometry doesn't accept that, negates that axiom. So these two axioms are logically contradictory. But then these two axioms are about two different worlds, two different kinds of uh, geometries. So there is no logical contradiction between them. So these are things that we will examine. Uh, but within the Euclidean geometry, you cannot have a contradiction. Between Euclidean and discrete geometries, between flat geometry and spherical geometry, you will, of course, have contradictions. Yep. You will hopefully see more on the, you will see more on the nature of mathematical yeah. uh, inquiry uh, later on in the uh, course. OK, Aditi? Yeah. Uh, we have another question uh, from Sriram. Once a research question has been identified and accepted, is there a universally accepted protocol on how to proceed? Or is it left to the individual researcher totally to figure out how to go about it? That depends, yeah. that depends on where. It depends on uh, institutional considerations. Yeah. It depends on the advisor. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, I think... Uh, I mean, I. The, there I are some protocols for data gathering. So, for example, there are some protocols such as, uh, such as, let us say, uh, randomized sampling. Okay, and some protocols that have to do with stats and so on. But these are largely about data gathering for specific disciplines. In medicine, we we choose to uh, go by protocols. Not all forms of medicine, but in drug testing you use the protocol of double blind experiments. But uh, those, these are not dependent on the question so much, right? It, it's very broad yeah. ways of doing it, uh, of methodologies. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a kind of recipes, right? right? So once a research question has been identified and accepted, um, it, it really depends on the question. Yeah, and um, also it depends upon the individual. Once you move away from data gathering that those protocols uh, when you come to broader aspects of research these are individual you know styles of functioning there are broad broad strategies not protocols okay not recipes and we will we will introduce some of those broad strategies so for example one of them would be look for logical contradictions that'll be one if you find data explain the data in terms of some theoretical propositions but these are not protocols, these are broad strategies. Also, um, once you, it, with a research question, uh, even if it has been identified and accepted, it gets, as you proceed, it gets sculpted, it sometimes changes, the focus changes. And so uh, you really, it, it, it depends on the individual the question, the individual researcher, and uh, the support system. Mm. So. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, okay. We'll take two Go ahead, Mata. Yeah. Are we uh, are we asking more questions? Is it now just questions, or are you? Do you want to talk more? No, open. It. Yeah. We're, it's open now. We are done. Open. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we can ask questions about everything that we have covered today. So perfect. Covered, there was yeah. there was something I just saw on uh, the distinction between intuition and logic. Um, uh, the, a lot of questions are very general at this point. Hopefully, okay. from next time, we'll have more specific things. But uh, uh, let's. Uh. There, is a, there is a book by Ian Stewart on uh, called Concepts of Modern Mathematics. And he, he explicitly says, I'm not going to give you the formalism aspect of mathematics. I'm going to give you some intuitive, intuitive. understanding of the different kinds of mathematics. 
and then he says, what, what, what do I mean by intuition? Well, and he explicitly addresses this question, logic, uh, intuition versus logic. Uh, says, logic doesn't tell you what conjectures to arrive at. You have some kind of intuition, and then you arrive at some kind of uh, conjecture. And what logic allows you to do is to test if those, conjec if those conjectures are true or not. Uh, and then he gives the following example. Intuition is the feeling that something is true or something is false without really knowing why it is true and why it is false. So he, he gives an example. Intuition is when you look at the trunk of a car and you have some suitcases, you look at the suitcases, you look at the, the trunk of the car and say, oh, that's not going to fit. And you ask, how do you know that? And the person who has that intuition says, I don't know. I just have that feeling. Intuition is the kind of feeling. Logic, on the other hand, is much more rigorous. Now, what we are trying to do in this course is to combine the two, the intuition and rigor of logic. And that's not going to be easy. Yeah, Quite I've, often, there might be conflict. Yes. And uh, we talked about the art and the craft of it earlier. Uh, intuition, in a certain sense, falls into the art yeah. part of it. It's not a craft. It yeah. can't be learned. Um, it just hits you. Mm. So, yeah. I, I remember a graduate student in Stanford who showed me some data from one of the Indian languages. And I said, oh, this is incredibly interesting yeah. data. This is going to be theoretically important if you pursue it. And she looked at me and had no clue. And she said, why? How do you know that? And I said, I don't know. I just an intuition. It's, and that's, you know, it's the intuition and yeah. the sense of plausibility that comes out of experience. Yeah. It's a combination of that. Yeah. So intuition is something, some, a feeling that you have not been able to prove yet. But hopefully, you will be able to. Aditi, any? Um, yeah, I'm just looking for the question. Yeah. So we have one question. Um, does any amount of observational uh, data answer a research question, considering the fact that observations most of the time are dependent on the frame of reference? Um, I am not quite sure about the frame of reference part. But I, let me interpret the question this way. Uh, can a set of observational observational set of data conclusively with total certainty show that a certain conclusion is correct? No. OK. Uh, we can only uh, say, given this body of data, uh, it, is, uh, it is reasonable to conclude that such and such is true. But of course, when you get more data, you might conclude that uh, what you thought of as true is actually false or reverse. And this is called, in the literature, this is called the feasible reasoning. That is, reasoning that is not completely certain, reasoning that can be shown to be, conclusions can be shown to be false later when we get more data or alternatives. Okay. So data will not determine the theory. No, so the question is, does any amount of observational data answer a research question? It yes. might. But there's a, a, this is where the process comes in, yeah. the process of research, where you have to look at it, you have to, when you see observational data, you have to find patterns in them and then justify those patterns, reason mm. through them to arrive at some conclusion. So uh, yeah. it may also be that you have huge amounts of data, but not data relevant to the question that you're asking. So you have to gather data, you have to have a question, and then look for data. But if you simply gather data blindly, you may not be able to answer any research question. In fact, in many disciplines today, that is a problem. Huge amounts of data, and nobody knows what to do with the data. And this is where beginning with a question. Um, yeah. Now, they, your data might be a trigger, but once it's a trigger, it has to be formulated as a question. And that way guides the kind of data that you look for. Yes. Okay. Uh, before I ask the next next question, there are a lot of questions. So uh, everybody, please continue this discussion on Reddit and on the discussion forum and so on. Uh, please conti continue there because we, there's no way we're going to get to even a tenth of yeah. the questions. Okay. So um, the, the next question, uh, so Siddharth has a question 
Uh, firstly, hi, Sudhat. Uh, we know Sudhat. Uh, the mm -hmm. other universally accepted protocol. Uh, oops. Yeah, other universally yeah. accepted protocols. Uh, that question brings into mind democracy. Does democracy have a role uh, in deciding what knowledge to accept? Uh, no, what knowledge to accept is not determined by voting hmm. or public consensus. So to decide whether the earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the earth, we don't uh, we, we don't do a survey and say what do you think. The uh, decisions are taken on the basis of criteria of truth, and we mentioned some of them. And as for universally accepted protocol, we would like to distinguish between protocols and strategies or norms. A protocol is something that you mechanically follow without thinking, and you get the answer. And also, one more yeah. thing is that protocols differ from discipline to discipline. Yeah. Um, so take, take the question, the protocol that I mentioned, double blind experiment in drug testing. But when you go to uh, infectious diseases, that is not the protocol that you use. It's called Cox postulates. But they both come under what is called causal reasoning. So if you have an understanding of causal reasoning, you can build your own protocols which are specific to your discipline. <coughs> so we are not interested in the protocols, which are recipes that can be blindly followed to guarantee an answer. We are interested in strategies, heuristics, and so on, which are much more fluid, not rigid like protocols. And the second part of the question, deciding <coughs> which knowledge to accept, no. um, that depends on what you find to be <coughs> justifiable. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and if it is justifiable to everyone, then yeah. everyone accepts. There is one situation where the, the kind of thing that Siddharth mentions might be uh, uh, yes. relevant, which is take something like uh, the condition that for a mathematical conjecture to be accepted as true, there should be a valid argument for it, that there should be a proof. Okay, that's a condition requirement. It is not democracy. So you have to find a valid proof. Now, the question would be, given a proof, how do you know whether it's a valid proof or not? Are some steps missing? Is there something, is there a flaw in the proof? No, there is no protocol for that. There is no guaranteed recipe. So typically what happens in mathematics is a bunch of expert mathematicians look at the proof and very, very carefully to look for flaws. And if they agree that there are no flaws, then they would say, OK, as far as we are concerned, the proof is valid. But interestingly, some of the things which are accepted as valid proofs have turned out to be not valid. So even mathematics uh, is there is some degree of math, some degree of uncertainty even in mathematics. So there is an article there by Ian, not Ian Stewart, um, uh, Stanford mathematician. What's Devlin. 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 That's right. Keith Devlin has an article called "When Is a Proof?" Not "What Is a Proof?" When is a but proof? "When Is a Proof?" And he is raising this question, when do mathematicians decide that a given proof is valid? That's a very interesting article to read. That has to do with yeah. this aspect. Yeah. All right. So we're close to uh, uh, almost 60 minutes. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who asked questions for their wonderful questions. Like Madhav said, um, we're sorry we weren't able to answer all of them, but please do continue the discussions on Discord and Reddit. Uh, I would like to end with one more general question, uh, broader question, uh, which is, um, can the ability to do research be developed or has it, or it has to be something inherent? So it can be developed. It can certainly supposed. be developed. Yeah. Yes. But it's, there is also something inherent, I guess. It's yeah. like singing or painting. A little bit of it. Yeah. But it is something that can be trained. It's not... You know, so uh, you can absorb it, you can imbibe it from the culture around you, um, and yeah, and uh, and you can get, it. you can yeah. get better at it. That's the important part. And uh, the the way you get better at it is by investing time and effort. The more time and the more effort that you invest in it, the more you practice, the better you get. That's all we can say. And we are hoping that by the end of this course, all of you will be much better at research than you are currently. Let's see if that happens or not.
and you can decide for yourself. Right. Um, one big point, uh, we will, I mean, you, you're asking questions, don't be sort of disappointed that we haven't been able to uh, answer all of them, address all of them. We will try and get to all yeah. of them. Uh, uh, they also have an option of asking questions uh, as through a, email. There is a special email that they can, and we may not be able to answer all the questions that you ask on email uh, because, you know, the number is way too huge. But we'll try to do our best. Yep. Yes. Also, we'll uh, go through these questions. And if there are any that we think are worth picking up before we begin the next session, we might do that yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, we'll do that. So. Uh, one thing one thing I want to add, because I think a few people have asked, uh, if if you don't get uh, the uh, the triggers and so on by the, say the, the documents by email, uh, it's on our website. Uh, and we did we forgot to show that at the beginning. Uh, so, um, and the link to that will be in the description of this video. We'll, we'll add that in. So if you ever need it to get to that, oh, it's already in the description of the video. Yeah. So if you ever need to get to, to uh, if you, if you, it could go into spam or whatever. So just in case, uh, yeah. everything will be on our website. But do join yes. the discussion forum, Google discussion forum. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and engage on Reddit and discord and so on. Okay. So we'll see you. Okay, so I'll right. see you next week then. Right. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Hope you Thank enjoyed you for joining it. us. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Good night. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.